the most important consequence following, and it's called the fundamental orthogonality relation. So let's take a look at that. By proving the fundamental orthogonality relation, we're going to be able to make contact with certain things you know in quantum mechanics about adding angular momenta, and we'll be able to actually derive some constraints on the number of irreducible representations a group has, and do all sorts of interesting things like that. So, so now let's prove the fundamental orthogonality relation. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to consider the following matrix. Um, <coughs> Consider um, B, A, B, R, S, um, I, J, and this is defined to be equal to a sum over all of the group elements, um, gamma A <coughs> of T, I, R, gamma B of t to the minus 1, s j. This is a busy formula, so let's um, think about it. So, so there's a couple of things going on here. So first of all, you can see I've got these labels a and b sitting here. So there's a and b. Here they are on this side of the equation. There they are on this side of the equation. What a and b label are the representation that we're looking at? So a and b label the irrep um, we're looking at. So you, you form this matrix by taking the matrix which represents T and representation A, and you multiply by the matrix which represents T to the minus 1 and representation B. Now, what are I and R? On this side of the equation, I and R are matrix indices for the matrix representing T in representation A. Everyone happy with that? Now notice that on this side of the equation, I plays the role of a matrix index, but R is labeling my matrix. So it's playing a different role on both sides of the equation. Please notice that. Here I would specify I and R to get one of these matrix elements. Here, to specify a matrix, I would specify A, B, R, and S. And to specify a matrix element of this matrix, I would specify I and J. So R is playing a really different role here to what it's playing here. And that's the same as these matrix indices, the S and the J. So J plays the role of a matrix index, but not S. S is a label for this matrix that I'm considering. Are there any questions on, on the role of the indices in that equation? Okay, so it might take a bit of getting used to, but think about it. Um, and now we've got Schur's lemma. Can you ask what the dimensions are on either side? Sure, okay. So, so what we've got sitting on this side, okay, this thing, let's say, has got dimension dA. This thing may, in fact, have dimension D, B. So when we take a look at this matrix, what's the dimension of this matrix going to be? Well, how many rows are there? D, A of them. How many columns are there? D, B of them. So this would be a D, A times D, B dimensional matrix. Okay? How many matrices would there be? Well, obviously it's related to the number of representations you could consider and to the dimensions of those reps. Okay, so there's quite a few of these matrices. We're just looking at one of them. <coughs> okay. Now, what is Schur's lemma statement about? It's a statement about how things commute, right? So we're saying a gamma of T A is equal to an A, a gamma prime of T. Yes, Rocco? I was just wondering the A. That's a square. A is not a square matrix if D is not equal to D prime. Oh, I mean d by d prime. Thank you. You're quite right. Yep. Now let me... Yeah, d by d prime. Okay. So, so, so Schur's lemma is telling us about how things commute. 
So it just seems natural that we should try to construct a commutator now. So let's try to do that. Let's take um, gamma A of T tilde. And let me get these indices straight. <coughs> this is IK. So I am indicating the matrix indices explicitly, and we're going to multiply these matrices. And this multiplies into B, A, B, um, more labels, R, S, and K, J. So the index K is summed. I'm performing a matrix multiplication here. Now, to perform this matrix multiplication, I am going to plug in my explicit definition for B. So this will be a sum. T, an element of G. <coughs> um, gamma A, T tilde. Let's say I, K. Gamma A of T. Mm, now I want K R. Gamma B of T to the minus 1, um, SJ. But you see, this is a group. So I know what the product of these two will be. This is just going to be, this is a sum, T, an element of G, gamma A, T tilde T, I, R. So I've done that matrix multiplication. Gamma B, T to the minus 1, S, J. And now I'm going to relabel my group sum. Um, like I did, we used that for a previous result. Um, let me just try to remember which one it was. Okay, I, I can't remember what result it was. But so, so, so we've got this. Um, we're going to now say T bar is equal to T tilde T. And I would now like to change my sum into a sum over T bar. So over here, I now want to sum over T bar is an element of G. Now, notice the following. How many values of T did I sum over? Order of the group, right? How many values of T bar will I sum over over here? Order of the group. Okay? And the other fact that I'm using is if I fix T tilde, okay, then if I start off with T1 not equal to T2, then T bar 1, which is just T tilde T1, will not be equal to T tilde T2. Just multiply this by T tilde, which is equal to T bar 2. So that means. This sum over here had to run over g distinct values. This sum over here has to run over g distinct values. So they must both just be sums over the group. I call this, um, the, I think this is called the right invariance of the group sum. Okay? Um, and that's what we're using here, right invariance of the group sum. Gamma A of T bar, I R, gamma B. Now, what is T to the minus 1 equal to? Well... From this equation over here, I learned that t is equal to t bar, t tilde to the minus 1. So t to the minus 1, I should swap the factors and invert each factor. So I would get t tilde, t bar to the minus 1. What? Did I do that correctly? Yes. So there's t tilde, t is equal to t bar. So t to the minus 1, which appears here. No, I don't like that result. Um, <coughs> I want t bar to the minus 1 t tilde. So t bar is equal to t tilde t. Um, t bar is equal to t tilde t. So this tells me t would be equal to t tilde to the minus 1 t bar. Okay, so that's my mistake. So if I look at what is t to the minus 1 equal to, this will be 
t bar to the minus 1 t tilde. Okay? Everyone happy with that? So I'm now going to plug this in for t to the minus 1. This is t bar to the minus 1 t tilde. And now I guess there's an important comment that I should make, and it's the following. Um, <clears throat> in moving from this line to this line, I actually used the invariance of the group sum under this change of variables. When you are working out the representation theory of groups, 99% of the theorems that you will prove use this invariance. For a finite group, this invariance is trivial. If you're dealing with Lie groups, you, you of course don't have a discrete sum over elements, you have an integral over the group. Whenever you can show that your integration measure has this property, you will have exactly the same representation theory for your Lie group as you do for your finite group. It turns out for the Lie groups that we've looked at so far, so OD, SOD, UD, SUD, they do have this property. Okay, so this is the property that I'm using. I could change the sum from T bar to T, and the actual sum would be invariant. If I was doing an integral, I would say the measure of the integral would be invariant under that transformation. So the measure would be the same whether I integrate over T or whether I integrate over T bar. That's a crucial step. And it's when you've got that being satisfied that your representation theory for your Lie group will be exactly the same as the representation theory for your finite group. <clears throat> okay, so what is this now equal to? Well, it's a sum over T bar as an element of G, gamma A of T bar I R. And now I can expand that out if I like, because I know this is again uh, a group rep. So this is t bar to the minus 1. Uh, this should have been s j, s k, um, gamma b of t tilde, k j. Now I want to compare this line with this line. And those are the only two lines that I want to keep. Let's put that down and see what we get. Maybe I'll put it here. So looking at the top line, we've got gamma A of T tilde um, IK acting on B, A, B, um, RS, K, J is equal to, and on the bottom line, this thing that is sitting here I'm now going to look again at the definition of B and realize that that is just B A B. Um, <coughs> okay, let's just get these indices straight. So the R S came from um, R S, the middle two indices. So here the middle two indices are again R S. Um, <coughs> And the matrix indices are I, K, times by gamma B of T tilde K, J. So look what we've got. This is one irrep. This is another irrep. And they're related by this matrix. But look at Schur's lemma. This is the content of Schur's lemma. Irrep, irrep. Matrix, 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 secondary rep, secondary rep. So we were told that A would be naught if the two representations were not the same, right? Okay, that tells me something. So what it's telling me is B, A, B, R, S, um, <coughs> let's say K, J. So this is going to be naught if A is not equal to B. That we know, just from, straight from Schur's lemma. But if A is equal to B, then according to Schur's first lemma, B has to be proportional to the identity. So we want a delta Kj. And I have got no idea about the dependence on R and S. So let me summarize this in an unknown constant. 
that I will call C as a 